The future, an elusive and abstract concept. How do we determine how the potential of the future impacts our present? And perhaps most importantly, who gets to define and shape the future? My name is Jordan Enos. I'm a second year Master in Public Policy candidate and a Pearson Fellow. From 2017 to 2022, I worked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, an organization with nine offices across five continents and an annual grant spend that rivals France's foreign aid. The reach and influence in global health is difficult to fully grasp. Over one billion people vaccinated across the globe averting an estimated 17.3 million deaths through partnerships and investments with organizations such as Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, the WHO, and NGOs across the continent of Africa and Asia. A story that only scratches the surface of the political and literal impact. And all the while, the looming question, how do we prioritize the voices and the communities we're partnering with while recognizing the loud power dynamic that is grantee and granted, giver and recipient. How do we really grasp what communities need when we're selective in who we listen to? We ask these questions in the context of Iran, where women are subjected to discrimination in law and practice, in Palestine, where residents of Gaza are experiencing daily targeted violence and beyond. Knowing when to step aside and follow the lead of those with lived experience, trusting people with unrestricted resources they need to survive, that is the path of resolution, peace, and stability we need to address disparity in lived experience. As we embark on a discussion about the Iranian future, we should reflect on the broader implications of how the future is determined, who determines the future, especially as the elite corners of the world come together, including academics and scholars at the University of Chicago, Congress and philanthropists, begin to discuss the future of Iran. I hope that every Iranian's dreams and aspirations of the future are at the center of that conversation. And most importantly, I hope the elite corners of the world are prepared to stand down and reshape their perspective if the future they foresee does not align with the future the people see and deserve. Please join me in observing a moment of silence for lives lost in the Middle East and for those who suffer under the daily horrors of occupation. Thank you. I'm Mary Louise Kelly, I'm a journalist with NPR, and I am here to steer us through this next panel on the Iranian future. Uh, I am joined by three people whose perspectives we're so fortunate to get today. Masa Arinijad, uh, Ambassador uh, Thibault, for, who was the French ambassador to Iran until last year, correct? Absolutely. And Suzanne Maloney, who has just popped up on the screen above us, uh, welcome. You're joining us from Washington, is that right? Welcome. Yes, I am. Hi, glad to have you, Suzanne, uh, joining us from, looks like the Brookings Institution there in Washington. So we've been asked to focus the panel on the future of women in Iran and women's rights in Iran, which, as we've already heard this afternoon, uh, is obviously a hugely timely issue in the wake of the protests that have rocked the country uh, since the death of Masa Amini a little over a year ago. Um, I was there and heard with my own ears earlier this year some of the chants we've been talking about, women, life, freedom. Um, 
harder to hear these days on the streets of Tehran, but you can hear them. And uh, so that's gonna be our through line for the discussion. I also just wanna acknowledge what happens in Iran obviously does not happen in a vacuum. And um, the developments inside Iran will be influenced by what is happening in the region and the world. Um, those of you who were here this morning will have heard President Zadio talk about how it almost feels off topic to talk about anything <laughs> except what's happening in Israel and Gaza right now. So we, if we get there, that's fine. Um, and, I, and I hope that we do and particularly can draw on your expertise, Ambassador. Um, but I wanna start with a question to you, Masa, um, about where we are now. After a year of protests that have seen people in Iran arrested, imprisoned, killed, executed, has there been change and start at the official level. Have Iran's leaders offered any meaningful concessions in response to these protests? First of all, I have to say that I'm very pleased that you call me Mahsa. My name is Masi. Oh, Mahsa became the name of all women in Iran, became the symbol of resistance, yeah. so I'm very pleased. Uh, yes, I have to say, right after the brutal murder of Mahsa Amini, um, Iranian women took to the street leading one of the modern and progressive revolution, um, shoulder to shoulder with men. And the response from Iranian regime, more than 22,000 people got arrested, more than 700 people got killed, teenagers, uh, like boys and girls, teenagers faced rape in prison. And, um, the family members of more than 50 innocent protesters who got killed last year, they are in prison, they got arrested for the crime of just crying for justice. This is the response from the Islamic Republic. As all we know that Khamenei and his gang of killers, they have only one language, language, language of killing, torturing, arresting, and uh, raping people. But revolution have different phases, you know. Yes, we might not see like people in the streets, but we are facing different phase of revolution. The number of the women uh, who actually practice their civil disobedience increased right uh, on the anniversary of, uh, first anniversary of Mahsa Amini's uh, murder. Um, a teenage girl called Armita Garavand, only 16 year old, um, she actually was walking from her home to school unveiled. And you know that, being unveiled, walking unveiled is a punishable crime in Iran. This is, I really want to show her face. This is the, the teenager. She became a threat for the Islamic Republic. So they got, they got her like in the metro unveiled and she got bitten up by morality police and now she's in a coma fighting for her life. And recently another girl, this one, Roya Zakari, she was the one got bitten up by morality police. What was her reaction? Immediately, she was pushed by the morality police in the street, she was not able to walk. She started to say death to Khamenei, death to dictator. So they arrested her and they labeled her to be mentally deranged. And we're all familiar about that. I myself, when I launched my campaign eight years ago against compulsory a job, the Iranian regime launched in a news channel saying that Masi um, is mentally ill. She uh, undressed herself in the subway and she got raped by three men. So mentally, they, I mean, this is their mindset. They, they think that we, the women of Iran, when we protest against gender apartheid regime, we, all, we are mentally deranged. But you know that we women who can deal with this barbaric mullahs, we're the most stable women in the region. Suzanne, do you want to jump in on this question of where things stand? Have we seen any concessions, any cracks in the regime? Look, there, there's always a debate among the leadership of the Islamic Republic within the political elite among the Islamic Republic over various policies. And so it's there are officials who have suggested uh, that, in fact, perhaps there might be some uh, uh, shift in the approach. But it, there's really been no significant sign of a willingness to in any way change the policy of uh, compulsory hijab or adjust any other policies 
to address what was very clearly the, the outrage of the population and the disaffection that has shown uh, on the streets is uh, what I understand to be as many as, you know, 25 to 30 percent of women now in major cities going about their daily lives unveiled, really just um, engaged in a, in a civil disobedience um, movement to demonstrate their disaffection from the regime. So I don't think we're likely to see this as an area where the Islamic Republic is prepared to compromise. It has been a core element of the regime's control over the population since 1979. You all know, I'm sure, that it was in, in March of 79 that the very first um, significant protest that took place after the revolution was in fact organized by women. And it was a protest against rumors that in fact hijab would become a mandate under the new system. And so this has been an issue that has been with the Islamic Republic for 44 years. There has been um, very little uh, willingness to, to demonstrate flexibility on it. And I think it would be such a significant um, step back uh, for a regime that has really um, based its legitimacy on its Islamist ideology to consider um, lightening in any way the expectation of both the, the kind of religious uh, modest dress code, but also all the other restrictions that are imposed on women's lives. And this is really the, the most important symbol, and it is certainly one that Iranian women have demonstrated they find um, deeply problematic, but it is hardly the only challenge that Iranian women face. Yeah. I mean, I will confirm when I was in Iran, both in Tehran and outside in February, that's probably a route where, I mean, I, I wouldn't put a percentage on it, but yeah, maybe 25%, depending neighborhood to neighborhood, but women walking around with their hair uncovered, a radical act of civil disobedience, and not just very young women, women of all generations strolling down the street. Um, we've heard accounts that the hijab law is now being enforced more strictly than it was then. It comes and goes. But I guess that prompts my next question. You know, we've been talking about the regime. Have we seen concessions? Have we seen life change in any meaningful way for women as a result of these protests? I mean, if you ask me, yes, women got more, like, uh, braver because they have nothing to lose, you know? Yeah. Uh, what has changed now, I see that even the older generation taking to the streets, like instead of mourning, crying, the anger is there. And it's like, I get goosebumps. I mean, when I heard that Mahsa Amini received the European Parliament uh, Sakharov Award, I was sharing the uh, news with my friend and my friend was like, oh, it's Mahsa didn't want, didn't wish to get this award. She, would love to be alive. And immediately I saw that Mahsa's parents from inside Iran, they shared the, uh, their statement on social media and saying that we are happy that the name of our daughter became the name of resistance and modern revolution against yeah. tyranny. So that actually shows you that the mindset of people has changed. They know, one of the father actually said that this revolution needs blood. Hmm. I'm a mother. I mean, how many of you are mothers here, fathers here? It's not easy to talk about your beloved one saying that they got killed, but we're ready to pay the price to end this regime. So that is why I'm really, you know, I, I wanna say that, that it, we, we, yes, the hijab became a symbol because it's like the Berlin Wall, and I always believe that if we tear this wall down, the Islamic Republic won't exist. But the protest against a compulsory hijab went beyond a small piece of cloth. Clearly, Iranian people wanna end the gender apartheid regime. Ambassador, jump in, because I wanna turn us to what the outside world should be doing about this to stand with Iranians in a quest for human rights uh, and the ability to speak freely and enjoy a free press. And Suzanne, please jump in. It's a little hard for me to see if you want to, so just unmute and hop in and we'll keep it conversationally, conversational. But uh, you know, as you know, in Washington, there has been much debate and angst over how you stand with the people of Iran without undermining the effort because of the long history we just heard about of the U.S. Uh, in Iran and will that undermine the movement in some way? How, are, how, are, how is that being discussed in Europe? How is that being discussed on the wider stage? I think basically part of the answer was given to us by Shirin Abadi. We don't have to interfere. It's a revolution 
a cultural revolution by the people of Iran. And I think the worst we could do is to give the feeling that it is something decided from abroad. And I think it is really the people of Iran who are in charge of this cultural revolution. It doesn't mean, of course, that we should not help. And it's what we have been trying to do, uh, more especially by recognizing what has been done. Uh, now, I guess Mohammadi, who received the Nobel Prize for Peace, she received two years ago the Franco-German Prize for Human Rights, because we really wanted to express our support to her action, to her courage, to what she has been doing. Uh, last year, this Franco-German Prize was also given to Masha Amani. So, honestly, I think we have to express our support without patronizing without saying we should do this, you Can should Can you be do specific, that. though, when you say express your support, how? By further sanctioning and trying to weaken the government, which can cut multiple ways? I, I think, we, well, as far as sanctions are concerned, there's a lot of sanctions going on for many reasons. But I think we can be on a practical path doing two things. First, it is to continue cultural cooperation. The number of young Iranian ladies going to Europe uh, with grants from the European government has significantly increased over the past year. And I think it is important to keep this relation. Uh, young people in Iran don't look toward Moscow. They are not fascinated by the Russian model. They are interested about what is going on uh, in Europe. And so I think we have to continue this dialogue, to continue to receive, to welcome uh, those uh, students, and to continue also to help uh, the ed higher education processes in Iran. Iran, and it's one of the paradox of the situation, more than 55%, uh, 56% of the students in Iran are uh, women, are ladies. So we have to continue, because if these cultural changes are going on, it is also because there is this higher education process going on, and we have to continue to help people to be familiar with what is going on in the West, to be familiar uh, with the values which are on the basis of freedom and liberty. So I think it's a process in which, once again, we have not to say, do this or do that. It would be completely counterproductive, but to give incentive to recognize what is going on. It's, for example, what President Macron did in France in receiving uh, last year uh, some Iranian ladies representative uh, of this cultural revolution. Well, it was not at all well received by the Iranian government, who, which criticized us heavily, saying, well, you interfere, you are taking a part, etc." But we have to express our support. We have to express our will to continue with this process. But basically, uh, it will be a process of changes in Iran itself by the Iranian people. Uh, Suzanne, do you want to jump in from your post? How does this look? How should the rest of the world stand with the people of Iran? What does that look like? Uh, it's, it's awfully hard to find the one silver bullet that will enable uh, Iranian women and the Iranian people more broadly to um, move more quickly toward a government that actually reflects their own preferences and wishes. But I do think that there are steps that the international community can take. One of them just involves ensuring that there is um, information that gets into Iran that is not censored or provided by the regime itself. And so anything that we can do to provide access to the Iranian people, to information technology, to news media, to unbiased information from outside is a huge net positive. I think that it's also very important that the international community saw and recognized and responded to the death of Masa Amini and the fact that so many Iranians came to the streets to voice their outrage. Um, that helped to fuel the movement, and I think that continuing to recognize that this is still a very important issue, that this is really just the beginning of a, a larger process of civil disobedience and action against the regime is something that, again, is very important. Just recognizing, calling it out, uh, continuing to highlight the struggle of Iranian women in the context of a very long uh, struggle for, of Iranians for democracy and then finally, I think there's something that all those of us who are able to still travel to Iran, unfortunately I'm not one of them, um, can do, and that is to, uh, as women, refuse to wear the hijab. There should, should be no requirement that foreign visitors 
uh, are required to wear the hijab. This came up with the U.S. service women in Saudi Arabia several decades ago, and in fact was a, the subject of some uh, uh, litigation on the part of uh, individual service women. Um, I think that it's completely reasonable for foreign, visiting foreign officials, even for journalists, to say that this is not my culture, this is not my requirement for religious reasons, and therefore I will not be um, uh, required to wear uh, a particular uh, a particular head covering simply because that is how you choose to impose on your own population. And I think that that too would at least demonstrate that the international community understands that this should be a, a subject of individual rights. Massey, I know you want to jump in. I just want to pick up on one thing you said and inject something of firsthand observation because you mentioned the importance of anything that the outside world can do to improve communications, uh, internet, Wi-Fi. Uh, <clears throat> and I will say, when I was there earlier this year, I, I can't overstate how important that seemed to feel. It is impossible. The internet has been slowed to a point where trying to make a single phone call was taking us all day on an Iranian SIM card. You cannot get behind a VPN. You cannot access things that, when I was there three years previously, were, it was downloading lightning fast. So it's very difficult to organize, to communicate with the outside world, to organize something inside Iran when you can't communicate or place a phone call. So I will put that there, that that, that is real, and people there really feel it. Masi. Yeah, I mean, um the reason that I asked the gentleman, Mr. Ambassador, to sit in the middle because I knew that I want to talk to you here uh, about how the young generation have different opinion. I had so much respect for Ms. Ibadi. I love her. But the way that we, we tell the rest of the world, the democratic country that do not interfere is not a correct way when women getting raped in Iran. When women getting beaten up, receiving lashes, getting executed for the crime of protesting, this is the moment that democratic countries must interfere. Because right now, um, a lot of democratic countries saying that we stand with the people of Iran. No, please sit down and make concrete decision that how to help Iranian people. And that is, um, I want to say that, a lot of women immediately when the, the brutal uh, you know, murder happened, they started to cut their hair. And I was the first one in uh, Canadian media everywhere saying that I'm very happy to see celebrities, well-known actresses, ordinary women cutting their hair to show their solidarity with the women of Iran. It is very, very touching, moving, and powerful. But please, female politicians, Western leaders, you please stop cutting your hair. Because you have to cut your ties with the murderers, regime of Iran. So by saying that we don't want to interfere, we just stand, we just give award. Believe me, the real award is not just recognizing our movement, our revolution. The real award is stop legitimizing the Islamic Republic. How, How do you do that, though? Exactly. Without feeding into the narrative that of the course. regime puts out there, which is this is just foreign meddling in Iranian domestic says that, business. My, my sister, the regime already says that. Nine, uh, exactly. 13 years ago, when I came here, uh, the reason that I uh, came to America, I got invited by Obama's administration because I wanted to interview President Obama. What happened? They said the same thing because right after my uh, travel to America, green movement happened. They shut down the newspaper that I worked for. They killed more than 100 innocent protesters. Then Obama's administration got cold field feet and said that if we do this interview, then the Islamic Republic might label the Green Movement. You remember? Mm -hmm. So, and after 13 years now, President Obama said that, big regret. We must have supported the Green Movement because either way, the Islamic Republic labeled its own protesters. I want to make it short. Khamenei is a big ally for Putin, sending drones to Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. The, the West must address Khamenei and his gang of killers the way that they address Putin. That's how we win. And the West have another duty. Like, I, on behalf of Iranian women, asked the leaders of democratic countries, especially President Macron, because he was the one honestly vocal and <coughs> calling it revolution. Help us, help us to expand the definition of apartheid to include gender in all international laws. 
then this is easy for us women of Iran and Afghanistan to actually end and isolate gender apartheid regime. And this is not, you're not saving us, you're saving democracy because the Islamic Republic is a threat to democratic countries as well. Let me, I want to pick up on a point a couple of you have now made. This is a revolution. And I want to challenge you on that or push you on that. Is it? And I ask that because, you know, when I was there, and I understand that they wanted American journalists to come and document, look how quiet it is, look how normal it is, everything's fine, nothing to see here. But it is, that is true. It is also true that it is quiet, that you do not see revolution in the street, that the regime has, through tools that you may vehemently dislike, managed to suppress protests and make it go underground. So are we accurate in calling it a revolution? I'll put that to you, Ambassador, because I think you were the first one who made that point. I think I use the word cultural revolution. Okay. And I think it's, which is very important, is a change in the mindset. The fact that the women okay. were there, that the men supported them. So I think a cultural revolution, it can take time mm -hmm. before all the consequences are perceptible, are really visible. And I think, we, yeah, Iran faced some in 2009, in 2017, in 2019, demonstration, riots against the government. But I think which makes a difference this time is really this vision, this cultural vision on the future of Iran, which is different from uh, the demonstration which took place either in 2019 because the price of gasoline has increased or in 2009 because of the election of Ahmadinejad. So the perception by the people of Iran is different. And I think it is why uh, we, President Macron, we are speaking of cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. Which um, doesn't mean that there will be a regime change the day after tomorrow. Let's be very candid, as you mentioned, when you visited uh, Iran last uh, February. Uh, so that leads to a follow-up that I want to put to all three of you. And Suzanne, I'll flip it your way first. I see you all nodding that a revolution can take time, yes. Um, what are we watching for? Like, what are the, what are the opportunities, the moments, the... I'm thinking about there are elections next year, parliamentary elections. There's a presidential election in 2025. You have the supreme leader who is 84, if I'm not mistaken, and rumored to not be in great health. What are you watching for in terms of what windows for change may lie ahead? Suzanne. Well, I, I do tend to think that um, when the obituary of the Islamic Republic is written, that we will point to um, the death of Masa Amini as very much the beginning of the end. It, it may take a very long time to get there, mm -hmm. um, but I think what we saw in the social movement that was born in the fall of 2022 were uh, different components than we've seen in the many other periods of unrest and protests that have taken place in Iran. Um, greater uh, coordination between different groups, uh, the a wider involvement between different social classes and ethnic groups, um, different tactics in terms of efforts to um, sabotage uh, both the, the financial system uh, and st state media. And, and as I said, this wider kind of civil disobedience movement, which has in many ways a longer lifespan, uh, especially in a, a country as repressive as the Islamic Republic, um, that can in fact over time build the kind of political structures that can create the, the platform for something that might be in fact revolutionary. Um, in terms of what the signals will be, I, you know, we'll all be watching. I will say, you know, Americans, certainly those of us here in Washington have been persistently re surprised by Iran. We didn't foresee the revolution. We didn't foresee the um, embrace of a kind of gradualistic reform movement, which then failed. We didn't see the kind of return of the hardliners. Um, and so I want to be, I, I think we need to be really humble about our ability to predict significant social change within Iran. Um, but I do think, in fact, that, there, that there's a movement already underway. The most important political moment will be, of course, the death of Ayatollah Khamenei 
Iran has only experienced uh, succession at the senior leadership level once before. That was also in a moment of, of some political uncertainty in the aftermath of the uh, uh, Iran-Iraq war. And of course, the, the leader who then died, Ayatollah Khomeini, had um, such overarching symbolic importance to the system that I think there was real uh, uncertainty about whether they would manage that succession successfully. They did, but that doesn't mean that that can be replicated because it's a very different society today. Access to social media, even as um, you know, sort of difficult as it is, there's just much more information about the wider world. And I think that the regime itself is much more fragile as well. Um, and I would point to the fact that they really, it took them much longer to, to quash the unrest in the fall and early winter of 2022 and 23 than they had uh, experienced ever before. So I, it's not clear to me that they're resilient enough to um, undergo a significant test, which a succession would be. I think on this, well, there will be parliamentary election in February 2024 and presidential election in June 2025. We all know that the candidates are going to be pre-selected by the Expediency Council, which is in charge of accepting or not a candidacy. So I think we are not expecting major changes in the composition, neither of the majlis nor uh, for the election of the next president. Can be Raisi being re-elected the same way he was elected in 2021 after all other candidates were really put aside by the Expediency Council. So this is a process which is controlled by the system, which is going to be put into effect once again. So I think we can, well, there could be some marginal adjustments, but it will not change. I, I do agree with the professor that the big issue will be the succession one day of the supreme leader. I don't want to enter into all the details about his health. You know, during four years in Iran, every week I met someone explaining that he knew the personal doctor and that blah, blah. No, that's stupid. But nevertheless, <laughs> uh, it will be uh, uh, the, the key issue. And as you mentioned, uh, the point is, which will be different is that all the people who had the historical legitimacy of being <laughs> with, Romani, with Romani have disappeared or will not be there anymore. So it will be something completely different from what happened when uh, Romani was designated by Romani himself with his legitimacy, with his vision among his friends. So it will be a different process. There are a lot of rumors that uh, one of the sons of Ali Ramenei could become uh, the next supreme leader. We don't want to enter neither into this kind of discussion. Uh, but quite clearly, it will be a different process, and it will not be just the repetition of what occurred in 1989. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, my, my fellow panelists uh, answered this question beautifully, so I don't have anything to add. But I want to say that... Um, uh, we don't have any election in Iran. It's called a selection. I mean, it's very clear. But what is future? The Iranian regime managed to take everything away from us. Our homeland, our freedom, our dignity, everything, our family members, but not hope. This is the weapon now in the hand of Iranian youth, women. And that, that is the only thing that gives me hope, that the Iranian people... Uh, believe that they can end this regime, but be realistic that it's not, I mean, if the West don't wake up right after this uh, surprise attack by Hamas to Israel and do not get united to designate the Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization, believe me, more people will suffer, more people get killed, more women get raped until, you know, the West actually show us the true unity and actions to, uh, to isolate this regime. Otherwise, the death of Ayatollah, I'm sure that they have planned for that. The elections, they have planned for that to get the attention of the media. What we need here, right after the Nobel Peace Prize went to Nargis Mohammadi, now the Sakharov Prize went to Mahsa Amini, we need a global unity, especially women, to stand behind this revolution in the Middle East, because I strongly believe that an Iran without this barbaric clerics, an Iran without these killers, an Iran without this 
uh, Islamic ideologies is going to be a beacon of hope for people in the region. Hmm. A secular Iran will benefit the West as well. I mean, with or without the help of the West, we will win and we will bring this regime down. But with the help of the, the West, and especially those who really care about equality, feminism, who care about women's rights, of course, we're not going only to save Iran, because honestly, I don't want the Western country to come and save us. I want them to stop save the Islamic Republic. But here we are, Putin, Maduro, China, Khamenei, Hamas, all the dictators, they are like the alliance of dictators are very powerful. They're helping each other, they're backing each other through sending weapons, misinformation, fake news, everything. But the democratic countries, we don't see a common action against dictators. Well, that's what I was just about to ask, because I, can, I hear you calling for the West needs to stand and now, and this is the moment. Yeah. And I hear your passion, it's unmistakable. Yes, my heart is there, you but, know. But do you see that happening? Is Iran getting what it needs from the West? You know what, the, that's a good question. When actually you mentioned that uh, France or the democratic countries should not interfere to Iran's matter. I was going to say that you are interfering when people of Iran saying that we don't want this barbaric regime, we don't want these killers, but at the same time, the US government handing out $6 billion, the US government and the G7 country trying to negotiate with our killers, that is kind of interfering. Just to explain you know? for those who haven't been tracking it, this is the six billion in yes, Iranian it, assets that's been unfrozen and put in a bank in Qatar, except it's now been refrozen. This is the money of Iranian people. But when it goes to Iranian regime, the money goes to Hamas, the money goes to, uh, to Hezbollah, the money goes to Putin. So for that, I believe that by not taking a strong action, by still negotiating with this regime, not we have so many powerful leaders. We have the opposition. If you don't recognize them, if the West is not ready to see an Iran without the Islamic Republic, it is going to be a chaos. It is going to be more you know, killings inside the countries. What I'm, what I'm trying to say, Nargis Mohammadi from inside prison saying that what we want from the West help us to overthrow this regime. But still the West is scared of using the word regime change. I get that. But this is the demand of Iranian people. The gap between the young generation, it's, it's, it's shocking. Singing solo is forbidden. Can you believe that? And, and the West say we should not interfere. If in your neighborhood some girls are getting raped, you say that, oh, we don't want to interfere. No, you go there and you knock the door and you... But we are calling for Islamic Republic to be accountable in international court, no? But at the same time, we see that the West are not willing to help us to do that. Instead, they're handing out money they do not designate the Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization, which they did to Wagner Group of Putin. And they do not legitimize uh, the civil society in, in, by, by saying that, okay, here we are, this is a gender apartheid regime, and we are going to use only one term, gender apartheid. Since you bring up money, I want, to, I want to stay there for a second, and I'll do two things. I will perform my journalistic due diligence and point out that if Tony Blinken, our Secretary of State, were sitting here, he would interject and say that $6 billion has been, it will be tightly controlled, it can only go to humanitarian aid and food. I get, I get that there are arguments, but that's not, that's not where we're going yeah, with this yeah. panel today, so I'll just note that. Um, for the record, I do want to focus on, on the economic frame just for a minute um, and talk about the lives of the people of Iran through an economic lens. You know, Ambassador, having, having lived in Iran, mm -hmm. having left last year, you've seen the inflation, you've seen uh, the effects of sanctions, I'm sure cutting in multiple ways. Do you see opportunity for change? Do you see barriers thwarting change in Iran's economy? I think basically the policy of maximum pressure mm -hmm. really was effectively implemented and it has some real consequences. I would say in 2018, 2019, 2020. Since then, basically, there was a policy of circumvention of the sanction, which proved to be rather effective. There was a policy of substitution of importation. People are manufacturing in Iran or in Turkey or in other neighboring country, but they are not importing anymore, which means that basically, uh, we have reinforced the grip 
of the security apparatus on the economy because the ones who are controlling these companies are basically related with the IRGC or with the security apparatus. So one of the consequences of the sanction has been, in fact, to give more control on the economy to the people who are really opposed to any form of change in the regime or to any form of change in the system. And it's the reason why Europeans have been supporting the GCPOA, because it was also with a view that it would help in opening the Iranian economy and in so facilitating some further changes yeah. uh, in, in the economy. By the time being, Iran, if you look at the macroeconomic figures, is not doing so bad. They, I will explain. The economy... The GDP has increased significantly over the past years, and the, ex the production of oil and export of oil has also significantly increased. It's not what it used to be before 2018, but it has really increased because basically oil is imported by China, by other countries, and now we are in a system which is very complicated with Russian oil going to India and being exported to Europe. It's a very complex system, we all know. So, in fact, Iran is benefiting from this situation. And it doesn't mean, of course, that Iranian people are benefiting from this situation. But the one who have the control of the system are making a lot of money with it. Uh, speaking very clearly, I met one day uh, someone who was asking me uh, about the GCPOA negotiation. And he, he told me very clearly, well, please, Ambassador, Tell me, you are going to, it's, it's going to be a failure. Why are you asking that? Because I, I am making so much money. Huh. <laughs> if the negotiation were to succeed, well, it would be detrimental to my business. Mm. So you have this situation, once again, where the person, the, the entities controlling the economy, controlling the regime, are making money. They are not at all deprived of resources. Of course, the people of Iran are paying the price for it. Uh, the inflation has been more than 50 to 60 percent a year in 2022, 2023. And for food, it is 90 percent or 110 percent. So the middle class people, the poor people, are suffering yeah. from the consequences of this situation. And they are the ones paying the price of this economic situation. The country itself is suffering because if you look at the figures, uh, the investment capacity has decreased dramatically over the past decade. And it will become a problem for the infrastructure, for the housing, for a lot of things, and also for the oil production. Mm. Because Iran needs to really improve the efficiency of the production. They need components they cannot get now due to the sanction. So there is a real problem of efficiency of the investment policy. By the time being, they managed to do it more or less with the help of China and other countries, but it is a real and major challenge for Iran in the decade to come. Suzanne, jump in. I'm curious what threads leap out at you from what the ambassador was just saying or what's on your mind as you look at Iran's economy and what barriers or opportunities for change it presents. I think everything that Ambassador Sibo has said is absolutely correct, that the regime um, ma has managed to circumvent the maximum pressure strategy and that the Biden administration has not engaged in the level of enforcement of the sanctions that were reimposed beginning in 2018 at the same level that was the case under the Trump administration. And so the combination of both the extensive learning uh, and experience that the Iranian regime has with circumventing sanctions, um, its overall control of the means of production in Iran, and the ability to export increasing uh, volumes of oil, about 1.8 to 2 million barrels a day, going mostly to China at this point, um, means that you know the regime is in better a better economic position than it is than it was uh, several years ago, and possibly in the best economic position that it's been in at any time since the early post deal uh, 
prospect when there was still the idea that there might be massive new Western investment in Iran. But I would also just note that, you know, what we found is that economic sanctions are not likely to bring down a regime. They're not likely to have that kind of catastrophic impact. Um, but economic engagement hasn't been a, a better tool for trying to moderate the policies of authoritarian regimes. And we can look at the experience, the extensive European engagement with the Russian economy, um, the fact that we are so interdependent and interconnected with the Chinese economy, and, and, and recognize that you know, there, there, are, there are tools of economic statecraft which can be very important in shaping the decisions of individual leaders and governments. But fundamentally, foreign policy cannot be affected primarily through economic tools because neither engagement nor pressure is sufficient to make significant changes in a country's foreign policy. Okay. Um, uh, if I may perhaps please. just add one point, uh, which is the unemployment situation. Officially, it's around 10%. But when it, you look at figures for young people under yeah. 25, it's more than 20%. And for young girls, it's even 30%. So I think it will be a major factor also of evolution that many people going to the university, getting their degrees, are facing more and more difficulties to get a, a decent job. Yeah, it's very true. All right, I will signpost that in a few minutes, we are going to open up, we are going to take your questions, so start thinking about them, and we'll put up a code where you can submit them in just a moment. Um, but have those in your mind in a few minutes. I want, before we get there, I do want to just acknowledge what's happening in the region right now and what impact they may have on Iran. Um, this is not a panel about the horror unfolding in the Middle East, but it's, there's no question that Iran is entangled and is a player. So I'm curious, and I'd love to hear briefly from all three of you on this, what questions are on your minds for how the chaos um, currently, mostly contained to Israel and Gaza, but how it might impact the domestic situation in Iran? Who wants to take that first? I volunteer. <laughs> uh, I think uh, basically what y you have to keep to have in mind is that Iran is really at the center of a circle of crisis. It's not only Middle East. Uh, on the north, Armenia and Azerbaijan, they are at war. And for the Iranian, it's a real problem because they need Armenia for their uh, cooperation with Russia and they need also to, to have a balance with Azerbaijan because a large part of the population in the northern part of Iran is Azeri. Uh, on the east side, well, you have Afghanistan and Pakistan. And it's also a problem. You have more than three million to four million Afghan refugees in Iran. And in uh, the western part, eastern part, sorry, of Pakistan, in Sistan, Baluchistan, you have a very unstable situation which is impacting on the internal policy. Uh, demonstration took place regularly in Sistan, Baluchistan. It is a Sunni area, largely, and you know, the, the prayer of, the, of, the, of Friday has, uh, has been arrested recently, so there is a real element of tension. With Turkey, the situation is not so easy neither. Of course, they have exchanges, but they have also a risk of confrontation, and they don't want uh, uh, in the North Caucasus to have a kind of Turkish uh, arc, uh, which would be really detrimental to their interest. Regarding the Persian Gulf, well, officially, recon, recon, uh, uh, under the aegis of China, there was an agreement last March uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, of course, it helped in alleviating some of the tension related with the Houthi and with the situation in Yemen and yeah. the war uh, in, w between Yemen and Saudi Arabia, but nevertheless, it's still a very unstable situation. Second point, you have the axis of resistance, uh, which is Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, the Shia axis of resistance, on which Iran is playing a key role, destabilizing the region, etc. Third point, we speak of the West, but we have also to speak of the East. Uh, the motto of the Iranian revolution was neither West nor East. Well, in fact, there is more and more a move towards the east. Russia recently, uh, Iran recently joined BRICS mm -hmm. with the support of Russia and China. Mm -hmm. Iran recently joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So it means that more and more 
Iran is moving toward Russia and China for the very reason you explained earlier with uh, drones, etc. But it is also something we have to keep in mind. And we have more and more problem with what is called the global south and the risk for Russia and China to keep more and more control on this global south. If you look at what is going on with Ukraine, you have more and more countries of the south which are supporting, in fact, Russia or China vision, or at least who are not opposing to Russia and China vision. And I think Iran is benefiting from this move uh, toward Russia and China. And it's an important element that we have to keep in mind. It's not only, you know, the GCPOA negotiation was basically the West negotiating yeah. with Iran. Now we are in a completely different process where Iran is more and more involved in cooperation with Russia and with China. China is by far the largest trade partner of Iran, and the cooperation with Russia has been developing both sides. Iran is supplying drones and uh, missiles, but Iran is also buying technology, military technology from Russia. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a complete game changer in this regard. And I think what Iran is doing is really to take benefit of the present situation worldwide. It's not limited to Iran, it's more, much more global. And of course, they have a major capacity of destabilization uh, in the Middle East through Lebanon and Hezbollah through Hamas and through the Jihad Islamists, which is really closer to Iran, much more than uh, Hamas itself, in fact. Okay. Well, that so was, yeah. it is an element which is, of course, uh, of importance. And you see what is going on with Russia and with China. Mm. I mean, Russia opposed to some resolution Indeed. Security Council, etc. So we, we are in a situation where, obviously, I think Iran, I think, and Russia they don't like each other for centuries. They were at war, and the Russian Empire and the Persian Empire, <laughs> we all know the story. But there is a kind of opportunity for Iran, which is to benefit from the situation which was created by in. the Let war in, in Ukraine. If I may. That's an excellent and illuminating primer on Iran's place in the world. Mm -hmm. Not actually the question I asked, but well but, done. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm trying no, no, to no, 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 no. It's, it's to, it's, it it matters and as we as we try to make sense of all this mess. The, um, the question about the horror unfolding in the Middle East, no one knows where this will end. Suzanne has just wisely counseled us to be humble about trying to make mm. predictions, but I, without asking you to make a prediction, what questions are on your mind? I mean, Middle East is like British weather. No one can predict because they have everything, like in same day rain. That's, that, that's, that's actually, it breaks my heart because what's going on in, uh, like in, in the Middle East, it should be the priority right now to, for, for all the uh, democratic countries, like to talk about the roots as uh, Mr. Ambassador, beautifully mentioned that everywhere you go, you see the role of Iran, the Islamic Republic, not Iran. I mean, that, that, that is another thing that I always want to say that when we, we have to actually make it clear that Iranian people, they don't want to engage in any war. Right after the brutal attack from Hamas to Israeli civilians, Iranian people loudly condemned out, ris risking their lives within the country. Why? Because we know that the people of Iran are being like hostage in the hand of Islamic Republic. People of Palestine being hostage in the hand of Hamas. And none of us believe that Hamas or Islamic Republic talk for us. So what we want here, I, again, I want to I uh, you know, express myself that common action that the democratic country, this attack should be a wake up call for the democratic countries to sit down and cut the roots. There was a massive protest in Iraq. The main slogan was like, death to the Islamic Republic. Yep. There was a massive uh, protest in Lebanon. Main slogan was like, get out of here towards the Islamic Republic. Protests in Iran always against the Islamic Republic. You see that. Now, President Zelensky is very vocal to talk against the Islamic Republic and the drones being provided by Khamenei to Putin. So we see that. This is the roots. But we don't see, I, I mean, we don't go anywhere if we don't, we're not making clear decision to designate 
Revolutionary Guards, which gives money to Hezbollah, to Putin, to Hamas, to Houthi in Yemen and everywhere. So, um, thank you. I, I am not being rude scanning my phone. I'm not bored. Y'all are sending great questions and they're streaming in on my phone. So we're going to get to those. Suzanne, do you want to give us a quick, I'll give you the last word if you can make it short on um, just Middle East. What are you watching for specific to Iran? I think Iran is playing with fire, and I think um, you know how this conflict plays out can have a significant impact on both Iran's position in the region and on Iran internally. Uh, Iran is the primary funder, uh, provides a significant material, uh, especially rockets and missiles to Hamas. Uh, it's almost inconceivable that there was no foreknowledge or complicity in the plot. And uh, Hamas has been integrated into this wider network of primarily Shia militias, that Iran has orchestrated um, so effectively, in particular helping to salvage the regime of Bashar Assad in Syria. Um, but this, uh, you know, the sort of catastrophic success that this attack has had on Israel, it's galvanized such intense public opinion and such a, a clear understanding of the need to not just ensure that Hamas itself is decapitated and unable to take on another attack of this kind, but also, frankly, I think the long-term um, ambition for the Israelis will be to try to ensure the Islamic Republic can never create and fund and, and foster a, a militia proxy that on the borders of Israel that can have this kind of a, a, a terrible impact on the country. So I, you know, the, right now, the Iranian leadership, I think, is reveling in the horror uh, but I think that it could come back to haunt the country in a, in a very terrible way. Can I add only one thing? Yep. When the U.S. Sure government, thing. Secretary Blinken and President Biden said that the $6 billion that we gave it to the Islamic Republic, it goes for humanitarian. I am here to tell you that the Islamic Republic strongly believed that destroying Israel is a humanitarian act. They believe that killing us, sending killers, assassins, on U.S. soil to kill people like me, it's a humanitarian act to save the whole world. So that's why I say that we, we're not going to go anywhere if we stop like, giving money to Islamic Republic, because as, as Susan said, it's going to go to the, its proxies in the region. Thank you. Excellent. OK. Uh, let me start making our way through some of y'all's great questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine some because some many questions coming in on related topics. So let me start with these two um, about Iran's Kurdish, Kurdish community. This is coming in from someone who did not give their name. Can the panel comment on the lack of recognition for Masa's Kurdish name, Gina, and the women's movement slogan coming from the Kurdish independence and democratic confederalist movements? Uh, an adjacent question, can you speak, this is from T. Kwan, can you speak on the intersectional component of the struggle of women in Iran as a whole and the Kurdish minority of which Masa Amini was a part? I, I, I totally agree with that. And anyone who raised this, thank you so much. Because everywhere I go, I say that very confidently. If Mahsa was not a Kurdish woman, um, and if the, like Kurdistan, and Mahsa's parents were not that supportive, supportive. If women of Kurdistan were not taking to the street first day instead of mourning for Mahsa, waving the headscarf and chanting, Jin Jian Azadi, we shouldn't, we, we were not here today. Yes, that's true. And I believe that the, 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 not only the slogan, the unity among uh, people in Kurdistan became uh, an example for the rest of the you know, cities in Iran chanting the same slogan and calling Kurdistan that we are with you, like people in Baluchistan. Every Friday, they take to the street and they were chanting that Kurdistan is not al alone. So, yeah, I, I agree that. And uh, Mahsa Jina Amini is not now only the daughter of uh, Kurdistan, it's the daughter of the free world now receiving a award and became the symbol of resistance against tyranny. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, a bunch of hijab questions coming in. Suzanne, I'll steer this one to you. This is from Anand, a first year student MPP at the Harris School. How to understand the challenge of counter, the counter narrative of Muslim women who think the hijab is their personal choice. They end up supporting hijab as a means of women's personal expression. 
Well, I think that's exactly the point that hijab it should be a, a personal choice and it is not for Iranian women. And so it is perfectly reasonable that the hijab is for some women a very important symbol of their religiosity, of their um, faith. And for others, it has other purposes. The, this has been, uh, you know, there's a long uh, scholarly tradition of, uh, of looking at invented symbols and how um, the use of hijab has changed over time and in different contexts in the Islamic world. Um, but it's clear that the Islamic Republic has used it as a tool of control of women. And I think that, you know, one of the, the points that I've tried to make over the course of the past several years, including after hearing and watching Masi's advocacy on this point, is that for many scholars, we looked at, you know, the sort of legal rights uh, for women, the political rights for women, their role in society in Iran, and the, the fact that people like Shirin Abadi had, in fact, clawed back um, greater space for women in the Islamic Republic and said, that's the real battle. It's not hijab. Hijab is just a symbol. We were wrong. Um, and I think that, you know, it, 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 the, the reason that the, the headscarf and the mandate, the, the imposed headscarf, the imposed hijab is so um, powerful as a, as, a, as a kind of precipitant for action among Iranians is, is twofold. One is that... Um, it is, in fact, you know, very discomforting to have to wear something because someone is forcing you to do it. Nobody likes a dress code. Nobody likes to be told that they have to cover some part of their, their body to please somebody else's um, perceptions of what is appropriate. And it can be very stifling. I spent about six months studying in Iran and doing research, and, and it's tough, especially with a, a lot of bushy hair, um, to, to go about your daily life and feel comfortable with something that someone has forced you to wear. I think the bigger um, issue for most Iranians, and this doesn't, isn't just about women, it's about the fact that, that young women in particular and, and all Iranian women, um, when they leave their house, they never know if they're going to be safe because somebody, either someone in the security forces or someone who just knows somebody influential, can accost them and potentially detain them and potentially abuse and even kill them for a slip of a, of a small lock of hair or some other apparent infraction of the morality code. And I think that sense of um, you know, complete lack of security on an individual basis, both for, for women, but also for all the men who uh, know and love them, um, that that kind of experience is what made this such a such a, uh, I think, a lightning rod for so many people and why, why there was almost an immediate reaction to the death of Masa Amini, that people understood that this could happen to any one of them. Masi, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that you may have a thought on this question. About hijab being part of, uh, like, choice or culture. Look, I mean, my mom wears hijab. My dream is to walk shoulder to shoulder with my mother in my country without getting killed. I don't think this is too much to ask. But it's very, very clear that... If there is only one woman who doesn't have the choice to choose whether she wants to wear it or not, we cannot say that the job is optional. We cannot say that. Millions of girls in Iran being kicked uh, out from schools from the age of seven if they say, no, I don't want to cover my hair. No. Girls in Afghanistan being kicked out from everywhere. So for that, let's talk about this, how women with hijab can help us. Show your solidarity. You know, like, it's very important when you see women in Baluchistan wearing hijab, all black, walking in the street, and the slogan is very, very moving, saying that with or without hijab, let's walk toward the revolution to end this Islamic Republic. This is beautiful. We need this solidarity. Otherwise, yeah, a lot of people, I, I remember, Suzanne knows that. I was under attack. For years and years, people were telling me in the West that, shh, you're talking against Islam, you're talking against those women who choose to wear it, you're causing Islamophobia. Wait a minute. Those who lash at us, those who kill us, those who actually execute us for just showing our hair, for just expressing ourselves, those are the ones actually, you know, creating the thing like called Islamophobia, which I believe that phobia is irrational. My fear of Islamism, my fear of Taliban, my fear of Islamic Republic is rational. Because we didn't have choice. As a woman who grew up under Sharia laws, I would love to see women who wear hijab everywhere, like congresswomen, to show their solidarity, not attacking us or saying, shh, 
keep quiet because now you're putting the life of others who choose to wear hijab in, in risk or in danger? Um, there's a question that came in for me about hijab, which uh, I can no longer find, so forgive me if I'm not quoting you exactly, but I want to respond to it. It was a question about when I, was in, when I have reported in Iran this year and on, uh, in a past reporting trip, I wore hijab. On a future trip, would I follow Suzanne's suggestion to not do so, to stand in solidarity with women and their ability to make choices? I will briefly say, I did wear hijab um, on the streets and when we were around. The thinking on my part and on the part of my team was it does remain the law. I have enough reason, I'm giving them enough reasons going around asking provocative questions to throw me and my team out. Um, I didn't want to give them another one. And I'm also keenly aware that I have a US passport. I will get on a plane at the end of the week or the following week or whenever and go home. But the interpreter, the driver, the team working with us who are local and the people who we interview do not have that situation. And so I, I'm always very conscious about not wanting to do anything um, that might put them at risk. I understand that there are people in this room who may feel strongly that that's the wrong decision and I respect that. But that was the thinking that informed our decision. I don't know, if I'm lucky enough to get another visa to go report in Iran, we'll make a decision you know, based on the circumstances, but I always lean toward being very conscious of the safety of people who are not leaving the country. And that's kind of what informed our, informed our thinking. I am also keenly aware of, you know, and that was captured by our photographer many times of me, American blonde lady standing on the street with my head covered interviewing Iranian women who are with incredible courage standing there with their hair uncovered. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, one to you, Ambassador. This is uh, coming in um, anonymous. I don't know who asked it, but do you think religion has a fundamental role in shaping the politics and societal order in Iran. I want to bring this up for a second just because we haven't really focused on religion. Um, if yes, is there a case for a pluralistic approach for the West to deal with conflicts? Well, perhaps if you allow me, just to say the dilemma you were just making reference sure, to is a kind of dilemma we had in Iran more or less every day. We know that as, as French Western diplomats, diplomat, mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, we risk nothing. Well, we risk to be expelled, but that's it. Uh, it's not uh, really a major issue for us. Why? We are putting at risk people we are meeting with, and it's always the same rationale, avoid to put people at risk. We know that when we are meeting with some people, they will be, the day after interviewed by the security people, they will be time to time put to jail. For some reception we organize, people were sent to jail the day after. So it's always a, this balance how to help people on the one hand, but on the other hand, how not to put them in a difficult position under the control of the security forces. Uh, regarding the role of religion, you know, I was ambassador to Pakistan some years ago, and it's a kind of chiasma. You have in Pakistan a government, an elite, an establishment, which is in fact very much westernized, and the people they are Muslims, and they are very faithful. In Iran, one of the paradoxes of the situation is that you have a theocracy, more or less, religious, well, in the char major charges, <coughs> president, etc., and a society which, in fact, is probably the most secular in the Middle East. And many, many people who are not at all driven by the religion. They are driven by their vision, they are driven by other factors. There is a very strong national feeling in Iran, a feeling of pride of being Iranian because it's a long lasting civilization, 2,500 years of civilization, and people have all the reasons to be proud of being Iranian. But I don't think that nowadays religion is really uh, the major factor for the people. They, it's a much more secular society than in Persian Gulf area, or in Afghanistan, or in Pakistan, or in other neighboring countries. And it's one of the paradox 
of the situation. No. Of course, for us, European, it's always very difficult because we are supposed to be secular society. We are supposed to be uh, anything we say, it's Islamophobia in France or in Germany or in UK. So we know, we, I heard it every day uh, during three years. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, we have to be very strong on our values, on our vision of the world, and not to enter into th this kind of dispute. People want to bring us saying, well, look, uh, you pretend to be a society of a freedom society, but you are making this against uh, young Muslim girls in France. Yeah. They have to do this, they have to do that, etc., etc. So I think uh, we have to avoid this kind of, uh, of dispute and once again recognize that Iran is by many means a much more secular society. I'm going to exercise moderator prerogative and throw the last question out myself. And it's this, it's a very basic one, lightning round. One of the challenges for people outside Iran, which is obviously everyone here today, um, in trying to track events is finding reliable sources of information. How do we understand what is happening in a country? where journalists are not being allowed to perform their jobs, where they are being arrested and imprisoned when they do so. Um, so I wonder if each of you would point us toward a source of information that we should be tracking, whether it is an account on social media, a book that we should read, a particular writer um, you know, in, in newspaper, in English or in Persian, um, but that you would point us toward as we try to get actually accurate information and facts to track what's happening in this country. Suzanne. I'll volunteer Iran Wire, which is published in both English and Persian online. It is a citizen's journalism site that was set up by Newsweek report, former Newsweek reporter Maziar Bahari, who was held uh, in prison in Iran after the 2009 Green Movement Revolution um, and has since devoted his life to public education and to citizens journalism, making sure that Iranian reporters both in and outside the country are able to um, tell the real story of what's happening in Iran and it is easily found online. Thank you. Masi. No, first I want to hear from you to where you go and find your information. As non-Iranians, then I'm going to give you my okay. structure. <laughs> well. Uh, I agree. Um, pieces of information are very often wrong, but <clears throat> the trends are generally correct. When you are used to read Iranian newspaper, mm. after a while, you understand what it means. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, the figures are wrong. Statistics are the scientific form of lying, so we, we know. Uh, so never believe in any figures. But nevertheless, it's very difficult for them to completely uh, really occurred some of the trends of the reality. Second, you have in Iran press and you have different vision according to the newspapers and you have very courageous uh, journalists in Iran explaining things as they see it. When you see uh, some Iranian newspapers, uh, Kayan, well you know what you are going to read. When you see some uh, reformist or moderate newspapers, you will have a different sound and if you're envisioned. So it is a source of information mm. and you, you have not to neglect uh, the quality of the press in Iran. You have people who are really very devoted to it. So I think we have it. And third, well, it's a very educated uh, country with a lot of people on the social network, with a lot of pieces of information. When they can get on the social network, yes. <laughs> More or less, uh, you, you, you can find it. So I think uh, you should not say all the media in Iran are not to be taken into account. It's part of the perception of the country, and I think we have to pay tribute to the people who are doing their job in this regard. Thank you. Merci. Last That's word. Uh, yeah, I was not, honestly, I was interested uh, to hear from you because uh, the Iranian regime is really good to manipulate the West and uh, sell their own narrative. So mm. it's very important to know that the true information comes from uh, Iranian social media. Like social media became a weapon for, for the youth inside Iran. There are many activists inside mm -hmm. Iran using their Instagram account and telling us what's going on inside the country. There are many of them still in prison, but their family members became now their own storytellers, became their own media, became their own, uh, you know, it's like 
unbelievable. But mothers of those who got killed, when you go to their social media, you find a lot of information about what's going on. So the family members of those political prisoners, they became their own media. So for that, I believe that rely on some credible social media account. As Iran Wire said, Iran International TV, they introducing these accounts as well. Or there are some activists and journalists outside Iran, like uh, having Kurdish uh, website. Recently, they broke the news of how our Mitagravan got uh, uh, kicked, bitten off by morality police. There are so many uh, Baluchistan -like activists having their own website. So that's the way that we get our information. I don't trust any media inside Iran. I mean, Nargis Mohammadi recently said that she learned from prison that she won the prize while listening to Iranian uh, state TV. So she read between the lines mm -hmm. because they are always attacking people. They're always spreading misinformation and fake news. So try and uh, trust on social media and well-known hashtag when it comes out from Iran. Masi, Masa. <laughs> Thank you. Suzanne, Philippe. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you to you. Thank Thanks you so to much. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks to all of you.